Hey, good morning and welcome to New Vine Online. So great to have you with us today. A uh, special welcome if you're visiting. Thanks for taking the time to join us here for our online gathering. We certainly pray God's blessing upon you today, wherever you are, whatever's going on in your world. Hey, I'd love us to to start by just praying and committing this time to God. But our, our music team, they're going to lead us in a song called Yes and Amen, just talking about the promises of God. And I'd love you for a moment. I don't know whether you know, you've been journeying on the Christian walk for a long time or you're brand new to this, but our God is a God of promises and he's true to his promises. He's so faithful uh, to, to what he says he's going to do. He'll follow through on. Uh, but I wonder if you could bring to mind certain promises right now that as we pray and as we come into singing this song that you can just be saying hey god i'm thankful again that you are so faithful i'm thank you thankful that you are true to your promises and it's quite possible that you might be going through some kind of a challenging situation at the moment uh, i know that right throughout our church family at new vine there are plenty of different people facing all types of challenges and uh, it's in these seasons in particular that we um, we want to hold on to the promises of God and maybe even just holding on to this truth that God is the one who is holding on to us, that he's promised that he won't let us go out of the palm of his hand. Uh, he's promised to be with us, to never, let, never leave us nor forsake us. But I wonder what it is for you in this moment that you uh, just want to say, hey, God, I want to hold on to this promise. So let's pray. Let's um, have this uh, heart of thankfulness to God in the fact that he's faithful and he's true. Let's pray. Well, Father, Thank you for this time again. Thank you for this moment that we get to carve out and come together virtually in this online gathering. And we come together in the name of Jesus, knowing that you are with us. Thank you for your promises. Thank you that you are faithful and true and that you, we can trust you completely. Uh, we offer our lives afresh to you. And I ask that as we you know, hear the words of this song sung out, that faithful you are, that all your promises are yes and amen. Lord, we ask that you would cause faith to rise in our hearts as we look to you and no one else in this moment. Lord, for those who are particularly going through a difficult season, Lord, make your presence known right here, right now. Lord, let faith rise in their hearts, trusting that you are the God who is able to, to do even far beyond uh, what we can think or imagine. You're the God who is ever present. You're the God who has promised to work all things together for the good of those who love you and have been called according to your purpose. So we say thank you. Thank you for your promises and thank you for your faithfulness. We worship you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Bless you guys. darkness you have filled me with peace give her mercy your my hand in time Faithful, 
So your promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. So your promises. Uh, yes and amen and all your promises are uh, yes and amen great song that is I, I love the bridge in that song where it says you know I, I will rest in your promises uh, my confidence it's not in me it's not in my capacity to keep going uh, it's in God's faithfulness that's where our confidence comes from uh, I love that truth in that hey, another way that we can continue to demonstrate our thankfulness to God for his faithfulness is through our giving and our tithes and how it is that we use our money. I found that uh, such a good way to approach this is having that, that heart of thankfulness, you know, that, that gratitude that we can have before God, recognising what it is that he has done for us, what it is that he continues to give to us. And as we, you know, sort of count our blessings, that, you know, classic phrase, count your blessings. But as we do that in our life, as we look at the things that we only have because of the, the goodness and the graciousness of our God, uh, it causes our hearts to be thankful, doesn't it? And maybe as we think about giving, as we, um, you know, maybe if, if you want to give for the first time, there's a link there you can hit there for giving, but can I encourage you to do it with that attitude of, hey God, I'm so thankful for all that you've done for me and Lord, let my money, let my um, pouring back in to what it is you're doing, uh, let that be an overflow of gratitude in my life as I continue to worship you in all the areas of my life. So thank you for the way that you continue to do that, New Viners. We uh, so appreciate you and your heart for God and his church and the ex extension of his kingdom on the earth. Now, a couple of things very quickly I just want to let you know about um, coming up this week. So Tuesday night, we've got our annual, annual general meeting, our AGM. Um, that, there's an important one. We'll be looking at a whole bunch of new things that we've been working through uh, as a church. So if you are a member, this is crucial for you. Please make sure you're there, 7.30 at the New Vine Auditor Auditorium, uh, Tuesday night. Uh, if you can't be there, can you please send in a proxy? There's proxy forms um, on the front desk at our New Vine building. So make sure you grab one of those, send it in with a member so that you're, uh, you can vote towards the different things we'll be affirming. Um, but also, if you're not a member, this is a totally... Uh, an open invitation for you to be able to come along. You can get a sense of what goes on here, be involved with the night. Uh, the only thing you can't do is actually formally vote on the things we'll be 
um, looking at. But 7.30 Tuesday, make sure you're here. Uh, the following week, Wednesday night, this is June the 23rd, we're back for another upper room. This is a very special one because we're having a local focus in this upper room. We'll be meeting at 7 p.m., the special time, 7 p.m., and that's because we're having dinner together, which is, you know, give a cheer about that. We're going to be having very much a, um, a taste from different parts of the world. Some different foods are going to be made for us where we get to share in dinner together um, because really our local if you haven't known that what that's about it's our response to to mission and justice uh, as a church and we partner with people and pro projects and programs all around the world so we want to get a taste of that uh, sorry that was a poor choice of words there but we're gonna have dinner together then we'll um, head into a time of prayer and worship and seeking God and waiting on the Holy Spirit and we'll especially have some time to be praying for our local partners and projects. So make sure you're there. This will be a fantastic night, 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 23rd of June. Now, the only th other thing I want to um, just quickly fill you in on, if you weren't here last week or you didn't get the service last week, we kicked off a new series called Moments with the Messiah. We'll be looking through the Gospels and looking at different stories of, of people or groups that had encounters with Jesus where you know, so often they recognise, oh, wow, you are the Messiah. And their life was either changed in, in some way or they either responded by saying uh, yes but no thanks and then walking away and we'll be continuing that series today. AJ is going to unpack a very very powerful moment that the disciples had with Jesus. But we introduced last week as we kicked off this series this idea of you know the different moments or the uses of time by looking at chronos and kairos, these two Greek words, and kairos looking at these sort of uh, moments of opportunity or significance in life. You know, we found this wonderful video that another church had put together that captured this really well. It's, uh, it's called the Kairos Learning Circle. And so we're going to watch that now um, just to give you a taste of the things we talked about last week, but also sort of setting a scene of, of how it is we can approach this coming series as we look at the different moments with the Messiah. So I hope you enjoy this video. The unstoppable force that pushes life along, whether we like it or not. It's something we try to hold tightly, and all it ever seems to do is slip through our fingers. Time is a roaring river that secretly sweeps us all along. There are instants, however, where we need to grab onto a branch and climb out of the river to see where we are along the ride. If time is our most valuable commodity, it is our responsibility to understand it and work within its parameters. In Greek, one of the words for time is chronos, referring to the time that we experience chronologically, a start to finish linear experience. Another Greek word for time is kairos, an event or an opportunity of significance. Kairos time is not measured in seconds, minutes, or hours. It is time marked by moments significant events where our lives change or at least have an opportunity to do so. We have witnessed Kairos moments as a people, as a nation, and we face Kairos moments as individuals. They can be positive or negative, moments of great triumph or moments of great loss. Many times these moments are unmissable. Other times they sneak by, camouflaged amidst the mundane. We believe that God uses these moments to teach us something. So, what do we do when we catch ourselves in the midst of what might be a Kairos moment? How do we ensure that we don't miss this opportunity to learn, to change, and to grow? Any process of change starts with observation. Look at the entire moment and how it has impacted you. Of course, it's not enough to simply note that something significant has happened. We must then reflect on the different pieces of the event and look into the emotions that it conjures up. It's time to bring the internal conversation to the outside world. Good decisions are seldom made in complete isolation. Who are some wise and trusted voices you can invite into this process? Who can you discuss this with? Who loves you enough to hurt your feelings when necessary? People that know you and know God can offer valuable insight. This is the point 
when you transition from analyzation to action. Often, this can be the point where we get stuck. We love talking about things that are going on in our lives, but rarely actually take the necessary steps to do anything about them. God is challenging you to do something, to change the trajectory of your life. And before you act, you need a plan of action. Mine out what the invitation toward action is and figure out how you're going to take a step forward. What would it take for you to succeed? Identify those who can hold you accountable to take the necessary steps and invite them into the process. Finally, it's time to act. Follow through with the plan that you felt God calling you toward from the Kairos moment. We can meander through life, experiencing it as it comes our way, or we can carefully watch for what God is doing around us and live intentionally and fully. God is the designer of life and defender of our joy. He has hope for us. He wants to see us reclaim and restore our life on this earth. Our challenge is to actively and intentionally search for the fingerprints that God leaves on our everyday lives. Well, as we continue with this series that we launched last week called Moments with the Messiah, uh, it's a treat for us to have Joy Chapman here today. Thanks so much for being with us, Joy. Uh, and really our heart in this series is not only to look at the different uh, encounters that individuals and groups had with Jesus when he was on the earth, but to, to hear from uh, local new viners about their own moments with the Messiah and how their lives have been shaped and transformed um, by Jesus. Now, Joy, uh, for you, it's not so much a specific moment, uh, but it's more of this this life of journeying with Jesus. And today, AJ is uh, looking at this um, story where Jesus washed the disciples' feet mm -hmm. and gave this incredible example of servanthood and, and humbling himself to this kind of um, act, and then asking the disciples to follow in his footsteps. Now we totally look at your life and think you've set such a beautiful example of someone who lives a life of service and, and focusing on others before yourself. Can you fill us in? How did, how did that start? Where did your journey with Jesus begin and how did that you know, shape you towards living this kind mm -hmm. of life? Yeah. Thanks, Luke. Yeah. My journey with Jesus began when I was a child. Um, to Sunday school, I made a commitment to want to follow Jesus without fully understanding it. But the age of 12, I heard a certain message and it helped me to grasp what the mm. gospel is all about and I knew it. And from then on, I then wanted to, to do something in order to show my love for Jesus. And so I ended up going and doing teach, Sunday school teaching. My mother was in Sunday school teaching and so I followed in her footsteps. She gave a great example and mm. I followed wow. along. I had a passion for it and, uh, and it was a wonderful opportunity yeah. to actually do something to help other people, to teach other people, to point them to Jesus. So yeah. my moment, my, there was no moment as such, one moment where God said, okay, go and do Sunday school teaching. Yeah. It was something that I saw something happening. I saw it was in fulfillment to serving God. Yes. And so that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's so good. So that started at a very young age for you. Now, I know you still look very young, but I imagine now you've been following Jesus for quite Quite a few oh, years. Oh, yes, quite a few decades. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that, that actually hasn't stopped for you. You know, like I know you've been involved in many different things. You've been serving in kids ministry uh, pretty well that whole time and teaching scripture in schools. Uh, even some of your work, you know, organisations like Compassion, it's so focused on those who are doing it tough in life. Mm. Uh, I had the great privilege of going with you guys to a trip to the Philippines uh, and, and joining you in the work that you and Ian uh, had, had set up over there. Again, a response to seeing a need and um, living out that, that life of serving others. So how, how has your journey with Jesus sustained you in having that outward focus all, all of these years? I think it's through Christian fellowship. I think it's through having Christian friends, through having a family who is Christians. And I think it's through the word of God to see what, how God has taught us. I think yeah. as I teach children, I teach simply because they're children. And so therefore I'm learning myself. Yeah. I'm being reminded of myself. And when the time came when Ian and I could decide, had to decide whether we wanted to go to the Philippines on a short-term mission, just two weeks, 
Uh, I, neither of us had a great moment that this is the time, this is what I have to do. We didn't get it from God. We got it from the word of God because it came to our mind that God says, go in, Jesus said, go into all the world hmm. and preach the gospel. So we're just going. We decided to go just as a result of the word of God yeah. and fulfilling what God's plan was. And that was one way that we could do it. That's yeah. the same in teaching children. It's one way I can teach children about the word of God in my local area. So can I put it this way? It's like for you, it's not about having this light bulb moment or having the right feeling that, oh, you know, all the stars are aligning, so to speak. But it's more, you see a need, you know that God has said to go, you know that God has said to serve yeah. others and, and not just focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you just act in obedience to what God has said. That's right. That's right. It is. It's, it's doing away from yourself and helping someone else. I mean, it's like when <laughs> I don't like being in crowds. So if I can go to a kitchen and wash up, then that's fine because someone else will come and they'll talk with me. Yes, and okay. so we get that opportunity moment with someone yeah, else. Right. And so therefore, I think it's not so much having to teach a children or go overseas. I think it's rather finding a spot that is where you fit. Yep. And it might even mean you enjoy making cakes so therefore, women, women, men might be, <laughs> men you can go to the shop, <laughs> but you might enjoy making cakes and so therefore you invite someone to come over for morning or afternoon tea yes. and you're thinking of someone who is just making their day. That's right. So it's just having that, that heart to serve. It doesn't matter where it is you're serving, just no. having that heart to look towards others. And how much do you think that when we live like that, when we, our focus is on others rather than ourselves, that it fills us with a sense of joy in life? Oh, most definitely. I really think because you're in line with the word of God, with God's plan to love others as much as you love mm. yourself, then therefore, of course, God's joy is going to be greater mm. in you. Because you're fulfilling the being, you know, being a servant, which is what Jesus talked about, what G, who Jesus was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Joy, I, I personally now, as a dad and as someone who has um, children under your ministry in, in kids ministry, I'm so thankful for all that you do. Thank you for the the hours that you sow into serving others, but thank you as well for the attitude that you do that with. And um, I know that sets a great example for me. I'm certainly hopeful that, that continues to set a great example mm. for us as a church as well. And that as we look at the way you live out your life with the Messiah, Jesus, as you follow his example mm. to be a servant to others, mm. I really hope and pray that we can all grow in our understanding of that and living that out, you know, just saying, hey, I want to be obedient. I yes. want to focus on others before myself. So thank you for modelling that. Um, yep. And we certainly pray that we can grow in that as well. And look, if there's some people who don't know where they can serve, then go and talk to some people. Yeah. Chat it out. You might get your light bulb moment. You yep. might just find a passion. You might just find being directed into some area. So look outside of yourself and to serve others. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for your time. And thanks Thank for sharing with us uh, your journey with the Messiah and for all that you continue to Thank do. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Bless you guys. Bye. Hey, good morning. It's great to be here with you. Let me start by saying, go the Blues. <laughs> what a week for uh, those uh, cheering on the Blue team. Hey, uh, we continue into our second week of our Moments with the Messiah. Last week, uh, Luke introduced the idea of Kairos time, the appointed time, God moments, those times that happen in our daily life where there's an opportunity embedded in the moment where we can be led by the very Spirit of God. I want to ask you this morning as we get started, have you ever had something truly shocking done to you? Have you ever had something truly shocking done to you? Something that took your breath away, it stopped you in your tracks, I'm sure you have. But let me focus that thought as we get into our story today. Have you ever had something truly shocking because of its kindness, because of its servanthood uh, done to you? As we continue our moments uh, with the Messiah today, we jump forward to one of the very last experiences that Peter, Simon Peter, had with Jesus prior to the cru his crucifixion. Um, it's the very well-known and memorable story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, and particularly that God moment that Simon Peter had with Jesus. So our scene is the Last Supper. Jesus knows what's going on. The disciples, not so much. I found it interesting in my preparation this week, just 
Seeing the differences, uh, again, between John's Gospel and the other synoptic Gospels, it's very interesting. John writes his Gospel much later, and I think he's filling in some of the blanks of Matthew, Mark and Luke. Matthew, Mark and Luke focus on the breaking of the bread um, and the sharing of the wine, you know, that laying down of the ordinance of uh, communion, which we're all so familiar with. And uh, the, the synoptic Gospels focus on the competitive uh, edge that's going on between the disciples, the jostling for position, the wanting to be the best. Um, Luke, Luke's account in chapter 22 does spend a little bit of time speaking about servanthood and it takes the ideas that Jesus demonstrates through the foot washing uh, into some teaching, but it doesn't actually record the foot washing itself. Interestingly, if we go back, we see that in the previous chapter to John 13, which we're going to be reading today, we see um, that it gives that beautiful account of Jesus' feet actually being washed with expensive perfume. So a day or so before the event that we're watching is this incredible other story about the Messiah's feet being washed with expensive perfume. Now, when I say expensive perfume, you can do the math. But it talks about the perfume being worth 300 days worth of wages. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars uh, in this bottle of perfume that's poured out onto his feet and his feet are cleaned with it. And this is a beautiful act of worship that caught everybody's attention um, and put Jesus at the centre. But in this story in John 13, Jesus adopts the posture of a lowly servant and he puts other people at the centre. Commentators will reflect that, the ancient, that in the ancient world, humility uh, was not really a desired quality. Humility was despised. It was seen as a sign of weakness. Uh, it was a world where power, pride and ego reigned supreme. The, an the antithesis of humility. These were the things that were sought after. And we also see that these things had found a home in the disciples' heart, their, com their competition, their desire to be the master's favour, uh, to hold the chief place in the master's kingdom. Um, and so Luke's account um, he recounts this dispute greatly. John kind of glosses over it, but we can see it in there. But we need to understand as we come to reading this scripture that it would have been totally outrageous for the host of a party himself to engage in the washing of guests' feet. In a cultural sense, what Jesus does in this story is truly radical. Now, foot washing had a long history. Uh, they lived in a culture that was dusty. They wore sandals. Uh, it's mentioned uh, numbers of times throughout the Old Testament, you know, a, a, a hospitable host uh, providing water for his guest, uh, even the idea of somebody else washing somebody's feet. Abigail, uh, in her relationship with uh, King David, uh, uses this idea of the symbol of, of, of um, washing his feet and his guest's feet. Um, so it was a normal thing uh, as a hospitable um, host to provide water for your guest, perhaps to provide a servant as well. Well, uh, to clean your guests' feet. But for the host to do the washing himself was outrageous. So Jesus was doing something truly radical. The supreme God is stooped over like a slave, clothed in a loincloth, and he's cleaning his disciples' feet. Well, let's go to the scripture. I encourage you to do some back reading this week and uh, I'm sure you will find some gems. But our reading today comes from John chapter 13, uh, verses 3 through to 17. Let me read for you. Jesus knew that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from the supper, laid aside his robe, took a towel and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterwards you will know. You will never wash my feet, ever, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. The one who is bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, you are not all clean. Let's pause here. 
First, let's just think about Judas. He knew someone who was going to betray him. Jesus washing Judas' feet didn't melt Judas' heart. And Peter, the blurter, <laughs> twice Peter uses the term Lord here. Uh, it's a big word, Lord, boss, master, king. He's emphasizing the upside down, the wrong way up thing that's going on here. He seems horrified, embarrassed perhaps, horrified. But the washing here is being used by Jesus as a symbol of salvation. Just as an aside, you might have noticed that I put the accept, in, uh, accept his feet in italics and in brackets. Uh, there's two lines of thought here from scholars. Both are interesting. Um, the first bath and the second washed are thought by some to actually be synonyms, e.g., you know, this is the way I might use, the, you know, in two sentences, house and home. It's great to have you here at my house. Welcome to my home. Um, and John does this quite often. Often in his writing, he uses synonyms. Um, and so then that would sort of relegate this ex, um, except his feet to a sort of an add-in by a scribe later on after the original writing of John to make some contextual sense out of the perceived blurriness. Why is he saying, uh, why is he saying you're clean, but then he's going ahead and washing their feet? And so some people, some uh, scholars think that the in your feet, except his feet was a sort of an, a scribal add-in. But the second idea uh, is painting a picture too, that while Jesus baths us in a once-for-all um, salvation, we, we all live in this messy world. We get caught up in sin and in darkness, and we need that daily application of just getting the dust off our feet, so to speak. Others say no. Um, the longer version goes right back to the early manuscripts. But anyway, however you cut that one, um, the main point is Jesus saying to Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. We join Jesus by letting him wash us. The first image here is the once for all salvation. And then we see Peter's reaction. Well, my hands and my head too, Lord. They also need cleaning. Um, part of the Jewish uh, cycle of festivals was a time in the year where they would attach to their wrists and their forehead uh, emblems of the scriptures, um, their hands and their heads, their, their, the things that they do and the things that they think. And when you stop and think about it, it's the stuff that we do and the stuff that we think that gets us most into trouble. And so I think what we're seeing here is typical humility from Peter. Whilst he's certainly a blurter, he's also pretty aware of his shortcomings. But the main point, we all need washing. Let's continue. Verse, verse uh, 12. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his robe, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. This is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. I assure you, a slave is not greater than his master and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Whew, let's repeat that last line. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now let's uh, notice two parts here. We've already seen that the foot washing is a symbol of salvation. And now foot washing, in the words of Jesus, is an example of a servant lifestyle. As an example, in verse 15, Jesus teaches us that it's not only essential for us to be washed by Jesus, but it's also necessary for us to wash, wash the feet of others. Let's get a little forensic with uh, uh, Peter's words. He's having his moment with the Messiah, his God moment here. His reaction on this day is clearly very memorable uh, to the other disciples. Lord, no, he first says, Lord, no. Um, he's embarrassed, it seems, and it emphasises the hierarchy here, this upside down thing that's going on. And then when Jesus is insistent, he says, well, if it's a yes, then wash all of me. And here we capture this heart of humility and we remember those words when Jesus, when Jesus first broke into Peter's life three years earlier. He sort of says, you know, get away from me, Jesus. I'm a sinful man. You'll find that in, in Luke chapter 5. And so we see that this um, understanding of his own brokenness seems to be a part of Peter's you know, the rich thing that he had in his heart. He understood this humility. I've wondered in my prep this week why the other gospel writers didn't feel the need to include 
this foot washing as part of their account of the Lord's Supper. It seems a really well-known and cherished story in our culture. Um, the other accounts focus more on the sharing of the blood, uh, sorry, the sharing of the bread and the wine, representative of the body and the blood. Uh, and John doesn't really give any account of that at all. But we can see, I think, if we look at it, that the, wa the water and the washing are a bit similar to the body sacrifice and the need to receive forgiveness. And in some ways, the bread and the water are a bit the same, the washing and the blood. You know, Jesus came to pay for our sin and to allow us to be, um, you know, washed clean and, and have, a, have a different way of doing life. I think Jesus' call to servanthood was a common part of his message, and perhaps that just meant for the other writers they didn't feel the need to, the need to include it here and just focus more on communion. But the, the other writers probably felt that they'd already covered it in their Gospels, you know, stories like, let the little children uh, come to me, and as much as you've done it to the least of the brethren, you've done it for me. You see, Jesus teaches us constantly that we should put other people in front of ourselves. We should look to the little ones. We should look out for the broken ones. We should cut across the normal cultural barriers. So remember his words. I love the thought that, you know, when we wash each other's feet, or, you know, the, the metaphor of that, that when we serve each other, we actually serve Jesus. Um, this is not only an issue of obedience, it's actually an issue of worship. So I wonder if Peter was changed by this moment, this God moment with Jesus here, his moment with the, with the Messiah. I think it's quite instructive, you know, that Peter, who's quite a, a sort of an aggressive sort of go-getter, speak before he thinks kind of guy, um, he was the one uh, in, in uh, 1 Peter 5 that writes these words, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And interestingly, Peter begins his second epistle to Peter with this statement, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I think Peter's humility uh, and his loving kindness are evident through his two epistles in the New Testament. He's a man of action, but he's a man of humility. He's a man of action, but he turns into a man of prayer. And we see that through the early part of the book of Acts, how he regularly turns to prayer and is seeking, you know, seeking God breaking through. Whereas I think the early accounts of Peter, we very much see a, a man of impulse and a man of action. Church history tells us that Peter when he was being uh, sentenced to death, actually asked to be crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to die in the same way of the Messiah. So I think God's moments in Peter's life turned him from a man uh, you know, of impulse to a man of humility. Have you noticed um, the same as me over the, over the years that we've had a change in our language around the term humble and proud? I, when, I was a, when I was younger, I, I think it was quite common for people to reflect on something good that happened, you know, with their team or their family and say, I'm really proud of that. And they just, they'd, they'd just say, I'm really proud of my son or I'm really proud of my team. And uh, now, now I hear people um, spiel off something that goes like, oh, I'm, I feel really humbled by that. I feel really humbled by that. And somehow this changing of the use about um, humble and proud has kind of got flicked around the way, uh, opposite way. I think when most of the time when I hear somebody say I'm really humbled by that, my observation is that they're actually not humbled by it. They're actually proud of it and they're sort of distorting um, this idea. How can we live our lives with this idea of uh, in due time, this Kairos moment, this God moment and step into it out of humility? I love that uh, beautiful quote from Forrest Gump. It's great to have a Forrest Gump quote in a sermon, isn't it? I'm not a smart man, but I do know what love is. I'm not a smart man, but I do know what love is. It's a beautiful thing about human, uh, our human character, isn't it? That we do understand basic things. We don't have to be smart. We don't have to be old. We, we can understand what love is. A good old friend of mine, uh, I asked him what he'd been learning recently. Um, when we caught up and uh, he said to me, I've become so much more impressed by kindness as I've gotten older. On the one hand, kindness seems so unspectacular. Um, 
you know, a kind word here, a gentle action there. But when you think about it, it really is spectacular. We should all be more impressed with kindness. I said, tell me more. <laughs> he said, you don't need to be smart to be kind. It's not the domain of the rich and powerful. You don't need any special gift or privilege uh, to be able to be kind. Everybody can be kind, but many people choose not to be. At the start of the message, oh, there's a great point, isn't it? Uh, we, should, we should cherish kindness a whole lot more. At the start of the message, I ask you uh, whether you'd ever experienced kindness in a way that genuinely shocked you, where somebody's helpfulness or kindness really stopped you in your tracks, taking your breath away. Sometimes I think uh, the kindness of our fellow human beings really impacts us at our lowest moments. The nurse who treats us with beautiful dignity, the stranger who helps us up after a fall and, 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 and you know, help get, gets us going again. That calming voice of a friend who comes over when they realise that we're overwhelmed by fear or anxiety. Or we're away in a distant place in a, and there's a non-English speaking local who sees us in our distress and helps us to find our way to where we need to be. You know, I think things like this make us realise that most people, most places, most of the time are well intentioned. But importantly, I want to finish up our time here by asking you, has the life of Jesus ever stopped you in your tracks? Has the kindness of Jesus ever stopped you in your tracks? Has the sacrifice of Jesus for you stopped you in your tracks, humbled you and made you look at the world differently? In Philippians chapter 2, Paul expresses it this way. He says, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourself. Everyone should look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Make your attitude that of Christ Jesus who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he came as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Has the kindness of Jesus ever stopped you in your tracks? I think that's where that first thing of being washed clean by Jesus, by being born again, that image of salvation there really grabs a hold of us. Today, uh, we've heard um, some story from Joy, which, was, which I'm trusting was beautiful. I haven't heard it, but I know Joy and her heart to serve is incredible. Her heart to look out for the, the little, the young, the vulnerable. We can all learn and, and um, be inspired by these brothers and sisters that God puts uh, in, our, in our church and in our life. Um, we, Fiona and I um, have, have seen people serve with such humility at times, but at other times, um, not so. Uh, when Fiona and I met, she was serving as a missionary on a ship called the Doulos, uh, one, of the, one of the Operation Mobilisation ships. And young people came from all over the world to serve on this ship. Ironically, the word doulos uh, is a Greek word from the New Testament, meaning slave or bond slave, or at the very least, servant. And uh, one of the ethos of OM was that when people first came onto that ship called the, the, the servant, was that they spent the first six months or 12 months of their time um, serving in a very menial or simple kind of a way. Um, so people were sent off to, to serve in the galley and serve in the kitchen or, you know, were cleaners or, or, or did the laundry um, or chipping rust or, you know, th things like that. And, uh, and one of the reflections that Fiona had was that uh, people coming from the Western world, more egalitarian societies, sort of picked that up and ran with it. But she had numbers of cabin mates who just, you know, came from places, particularly in Asia, where they were from well-to-do families. They're Christians through and through. But the idea of cleaning the toilet or serving somebody food, uh, you know, or chipping rust, was just that was that was beneath them they hadn't and it was a real learning experience for them to take on this idea of seeing the example uh, in what Jesus had done so we're called to be servants this word doulos servant bond slave uh, we saw Peter refer to that himself in that in that first verse of, um, of uh, second Peter we also if we we'll read through it that Paul often talks about himself as a slave or a bond slave we're servants it's a high calling we are bound to 
Jesus himself. We're called to serve each other and to serve God. I've never really liked the word volunteer, and in particularly when it's used in relationship to the church. It somehow implies to me when you say, oh, someone volunteers at the church, that the church is somehow something without the person. You know, I volunteer uh, in this thing called church. But the church is the people. You know, the incorporated body, the bricks and mortar on the corner, they're not really the church. The church is the the church is the people. So I kind of get how you can volunteer for the Rural Fire Brigade or you can be a volunteer with the Lions Club or you are a volunteer with the local football club. But to say you're a volunteer for the church to me sounds a little bit like you're not really part of the church. You're just volunteering for the church as an organisation or structure. And I, and I feel like we're, we're somehow we kind of lose something by that because it's not the case. The, the, the church only exists because we are the church. I feel like the truth that Jesus is, that the, the actual truth is that Jesus has actually conscripted us into his ranks and he calls us to be his servants, servants to one another and servants to him as as the king. A servant is what we are called to be, not a volunteer, a servant, uh, called to radical service of the king and radical service of each other. So somehow calling ourselves volunteers in the context of church seems to diminish the real truth to me. I noticed a couple of weeks ago during the old boys round, did you, did you, did you watch it? The crowd were going, Newcastle, Newcastle. Well, it didn't get the team up. The crowd were cheering Newcastle, but Newcastle were not coming up with the goods. Um, when, we, when we chant Newcastle, um, you know, as, as supporters of our team, I, I, I hear how it expresses something of a regional pride and it's certainly cheering the team on. Or maybe with the dismal form in recent years, it's more like a desperate cry <laughs> that one day things could get better. On the other hand, <laughs> when you hear that call out, Queenslander, Queenslander, <laughs> it's a more powerful chant. It, it sends a chill down the spine of every Blues fan. During the week, even 30 points ahead with 20 minutes to go, I was still anxious that Queensland would somehow rally as the crowd called Queenslander. And uh, I've seen it more times over the years than I like to admit. When Queenslanders call Queenslander, it inspires their team, but it also inspires the individual. It conveys much more than a, you know, supporting your state, supporting your region, supporting your town. It comes with this cheering on of the in individual that's sort of projecting forward what it means to be a, a Queenslander. You know, the individual who's charging the ball forward with the crowd calling out, um, there's this unspoken message uh, that's tied up in this phrase, Queenslander. Uh, a Queenslander's tough. They play right to the end. They're inventive. They play as one team. And so there's this sense of what we belong to that's there, I think, encapsulated in that, in that spine-chilling call, Queenslander. I wonder one day whether we will have a call that's new viner, new viner. What does it actually mean to be a follower of Christ? at New Vine. I hope we can look to each other as followers of Christ and from time to time maybe this idea of New Vine are not being shouted out but maybe just a, a knowing look across a room that just you know thinks about that other person and goes there's a new viner. They're not a new. They're not a volunteer. They're a new viner. That's what a follower of Jesus looks like at New Vine. You know, passionate in worship, passionate in prayer, a heart towards heaven. There's a new viner. Um, looking out for each other, forgiving each other, hands towards humanity. There's a new viner. Sharing faith, opening our homes, sacrificing for others. There's a new viner. We do life with Jesus. Um, we do life in community. We do life on mission. There's a new viner. So I love the thought of what it means to be a servant of God and a servant to one another. I think that's what Jesus came and in doing this feet washing of his disciples, he laid out in front of all who would follow him uh, forever. So most importantly, as we finish, I want to ask you, have you had those moments with the Messiah, where you've caught a glimpse of what he did, that liberating look at the cross that frees you to be who you're truly meant to be.
Jesus says to Peter, you don't understand, but in the future you will. I've shown you the way to be a servant and you will be blessed if you do this. Remember Forrest Gump, I'm not a smart man, but I do know what love is. You don't understand, but one day you will. We get this beautiful opportunity through hindsight to see that Jesus came to wash us and, and, and for us to enter into his family and to send us on a whole new trajectory where we can be servants and we can listen and look carefully all the time for those God moments that God's bringing into our lives. He's going to bring some into our life this very week. As we finish, would you just join with me and ask that God would continue to humble our heart and continue, continue to open our eyes to those things around us that we can step into in his name. Thank you. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, thank you for the inspiration that's in this story. Lord, we thank you for the inspiration of people uh, that have guided us and led us and shown us the way to follow you. Lord, we do continue to ask that you would, you would allow humility to live here, live in us. And Lord, we ask that this very week you'd open our eyes to those opportunities that you're bringing our way to, to be kind. Lord, to uh, show love, to speak words of life and truth. Lord, to um, walk with you to walk in community and be on mission. Lord, we invite you into our 24-7. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a great week. Everything with breath, repeat the sound. 
angels, all his children, clean as pure, as good grace, good God, his name is Jesus. Praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, the clean as pure, ask good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Jesus, our redemption. Our salvation is in His blood. Jesus, light of heaven, a friend forever, His kingdom come. Well, that's about a wrap from us today. Thanks for joining with us. Uh, thanks again to AJ for those words and uh, looking at that powerful story where Jesus bends down here. He washes the disciples' feet. Um, I like what AJ was saying as well about this idea of, you know, let, let's not think of it like volunteering. Uh, let's recognise that the example, the model that Jesus set for us, the life that he calls us to, it's a life of service where we love one another, where we're willing to, to serve one another and adopt that attitude. Uh, what does it mean? For you to be a new viner, to embrace this life of doing life with Jesus, doing life in community and together doing life on mission. Um, I pray and hope that you have your own moments with the Messiah this week, that you are open to those, you know, those Kairos sort of God moments where the Holy Spirit is redirecting your thinking and that you don't just, you know, experience those moments, but you're actually moved by those moments, moved into action and the trajectory of our lives continually move towards uh, a, a deeper life of following Jesus and union with God. God bless you guys. If you would like prayer for anything, uh, please hit the, the prayer button there. Uh, again, there are people who are willing and able to pray with you right now online and pray directly into your situations. Uh, otherwise, we look forward to seeing you soon, either at the AGM or maybe our upcoming upper room. And uh, we pray that you have a wonderful week. God bless you.